Hi, I'm Dr. Brian Kaufman, a retired family doctor and a CLL patient myself, the co-founder, executive vice president, and chief medical officer of the CLL Society here at ASH 2024. Hi, I'm Megan Thompson. I am a hematologist focusing on chronic lymphocytic leukemia at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. Dr. Thompson, one of the important questions for patients is, what's the best way to sequence these drugs? And we're getting more and more drugs that are more and more effective, but there's a question, will this drug work after that drug? And sometimes these studies just can't be done in a prospective way because they would take years, maybe even decades to get answers. But you've looked at some of this data in a retrospective way, so can you tell us about the tr one of your research that you're presenting here at ASH that looks at this class of non-covalent BTK inhibitors. So remind us what a non-covalent BTK inhibitor is and explain your research to us. Absolutely. So as you mentioned, there's this newer class of drugs called non-covalent BTK inhibitors. And these are oral pills that target BTK similar to drugs like a brutinib, a calibrutinib, and xanabrutinib, which are known as covalent inhibitors. But the non-covalent inhibitors were designed to overcome some of the shortcomings that we see with covalent inhibitors, for example, side effects, but also resistance. So patients who progress on um, drugs like abrutinib, calibrutinib, and xanabrutinib. And the non-covalent inhibitors include drugs like pirtabrutinib, which is now uh, FDA approved for relapsed refractory CL, and there's others in clinical trials, for example, nemtabrutinib. So these drugs are being used um, both commercially now and in clinical trials, but like all therapies in CLL, they don't work forever, and then patients relapse. So that's what you were looking at, is what happens to these patients. So we have some data, maybe set the stage for us. We know if patients relapse on one of the first or second generation BTK inhibitors, that we have rescue medications like venetoclax. So is this what we were trying to figure out? Would other medications work after uh, they relapsed after a non-covalent BTK, BTK inhibitor? Is that where we're going? Absolutely. So because we have patients who are initially treated on clinical trials and now who can use pirtabrutinib outside of a clinical trial, one of the important questions facing patients and clinicians is what's next? And there are these patients who ultimately, despite excellent outcomes with drugs like pirtabrutinib, do progress. And so we need data to figure out what the best treatment strategy is after. This can also be important in thinking about where drugs like pirtabrutinib and other non-covalent inhibitors can be used in sequencing treatment throughout a patient's CLL course. So we aimed, a group of investigators looked at data retrospectively, so looking back um, at patients who had discontinued a non-covalent BTK inhibitor for any reason and then collected data on what treatments they got after that. So now you got me all excited. So what did your data show when you looked retrospectively? Yeah, so we actually looked at both CLL patients and then separately at a cohort of patients with Richter's transformation who received a non-covalent BTK inhibitor. Focusing in on the CLL patients, um, we identified over 100 patients who had discontinued a non-covalent BTK inhibitor, many of whom went on to get another therapy. One and did they to stop them because the disease was progressing? Was that the main thing or was it intolerance? Or? Yeah, so many of them did stop due to disease progression. Um, there was a subset of patients who stopped for other reasons, including toxicity, although that was a smaller proportion of patients. Um, and we looked at kind of different groupings of treatments. Um, and I would say there's no standard of care in this space. So this data is really important. Um, to you know, guide clinicians right now and also think about what strategies should be in the future. One thing that we found is that for patients who had not received venetoclax prior to a non-covalent BTK inhibitor, the response rate for venetoclax was quite high following um, a discontinuation of the non-covalent inhibitor. So going from a non-covalent inhibitor to venetoclax seemed to work well. The majority of patients who did that did not receive prior venetoclax. 
um, we found that overall there was a median of all therapies combined, there's a median progression free survival for the next line of therapy of about 15 months. And so there uh, you know, are treatments um, that can be effective, but that duration is short, and I think we have room to, to improve upon uh, that number. And for CLL patients, it's all about getting to the next line of therapy because none of these therapies that we started seeing are curative, so you've got to be thinking about your next line. But it, it is reassuring that after both now, we, we've known for a while, after a covalent uh, BTK inhibitor that venetoclax would work, now we know that after a non-covalent venetoclax and other therapies will also work and at least give patient more than a year to sort of plan what their next move is. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, looking at uh, available therapies, there's a lot of, clini you know, clinical trials going on now for patients who have um, maybe received venetoclax already. Um, and so I think that this data highlights um, that, uh, you know, we have a little bit more work to do for these patients, but there are therapies out there. Um, and as we have more and more clinical trials after non-covalent BTK inhibitors, after covalent inhibitors and venetoclax, um, we'll gather more and more data, but this is kind of a first look. Well, thank you so much for what you're doing here. Any final thoughts or a message for patients you want to say about this kind of research? Yeah, I, I think it's uh, just a testament to um, uh, patients, um, a lot of these patients who were treated with non-covalent inhibitors participated in clinical trials initially. Um, you know, if we we're having this interview five years ago, the clinical trials were uh, just starting of non-covalent inhibitors, um, and now we have an agent approved in this class. So um, really um, outstanding um, to have this treatment option available, thanks to uh, patients and, and their bravery for participating. Yeah, I can't thank patients enough for entering clinical trials, but I also think that patients can get their best possible care inside clinical trials. Dr. Thompson, thank you so much for you, what you and your colleagues are doing in research and caring for CLL patients. Thank you. Thank you.